Decking out this room will be such a thrill, Mason chimed as he declared, staking his claim. You try to fuss, Ma, and you'll see me leaving you to fend for yourself. The cutting edge to his words caught me off guard. I had barely closed the front door of my modest home, where memories with my late husband lingered, when Mason began barking orders. Amber, his wife, stood in the corner, scrolling through her phone, barely acknowledging me. Give it a rest, Amber. We're here now? Better make the best of it, Mason said, glancing in her direction. Amber sighed, putting her phone away. I shuffled into the living room, feeling the weight of my decision. My husband had passed away just a year ago, and now I'd agreed to let Mason and Amber move in. I expected support, companionship. I didn't expect this hostility. Nora, where do you keep the good plates? Amber asked wearily, walking into the kitchen. In the cabinet above the sink, I replied, trying to keep a positive tone. Why do you need them right now? Just checking. You know, we have friends over sometimes. Don't want them eating off these cheap ones, she said dismissively, picking up one of the plates from the drying rack and looking at it critically. I bit my tongue. I wanted to protest, but Mason gave me a look that froze the words in my throat. Amber, just leave it. We'll buy new plates if we need to, Mason said, as if I wasn't even there. The house might have been small, but it was filled with memories. Pictures of family holidays adorned the walls. I tried to remind myself that I had made this choice for the sake of family, but something in Mason's tone made me uneasy. It was late afternoon, and the sunlight streamed through the windows, casting long shadows on the worn carpet. I eyed the dining area, already imagining the arguments yet to come. My stomach turned at the thought. "'Mason, can we talk for a moment?' I asked, trying to sound assertive. "'Sure, Ma. What's up?' He responded with a fake warmth, following me into the hallway. "'Why the rush to claim your room? You said you needed help, and I let you move in. Show a little respect, please,' I said, trying to maintain eye contact. He folded his arms, leaning against the wall. "'Respect? Ma, we're here to help you out, too. Don't forget that.' I nodded, unwilling to argue further. I retreated to my bedroom seat, the only place where I felt I still had control. As I sat on the edge of my bed, I looked at the framed photo of my husband on the nightstand. His kind eyes seemed to offer me strength. Amber's voice floated down the hallway, interrupting my thoughts. Mason, how about we order in tonight? I'm not in the mood to cook. Fine by me, Mason replied, his voice indifferent. I felt a mixture of frustration and sadness. I hadn't anticipated how disruptive their presence would be. A few hours later, the house was filled with the aroma of takeout. I joined them at the table, where Mason and Amber were already eating. Nora, do you want some? Amber asked, not looking up from her food. Sure, I responded, sitting down. So, Ma, any interesting plans for tomorrow? Mason asked between bites. I was thinking of visiting the market, stock up on some fresh produce, I said, hoping he might engage in a real conversation. Amber, he interrupted, clearly not paying attention to me. We should go check out that furniture store you mentioned. Yes. We need to update a few things around here, Amber said excitedly. I sighed, putting down my fork. I'd appreciate if we could discuss changes before jumping into them. Ma, we'll take care of it, don't worry, Mason said, dismissively, already looking back at his phone. I felt an unsettling chill. My home, once filled with love, now felt alien. This wasn't the beginning I had hoped for. The next few days passed in a blur of tension and biting comments. Every time Amber opened her mouth, it seemed to be to criticize or demand something new. Any attempt to create harmony was met with sneers and dismissive gestures. One evening, as I sorted through some old papers at the dining table, Mason walked in, rifling through the mail. "'Bills, bills, and more bills. Do you ever not get these, Ma?' he muttered loudly. "'They come with living in the house, Mason,' I said patiently. "'It's normal.' "'Well, you should try and cut down on your expenses.' This is starting to get out of hand, he said, tossing the mail onto the table. His tone was sharp, lacking any hint of compassion. From the living room, Amber's voice carried through. Mason, did you forget about tomorrow's payments? You promised to handle it. Yeah, yeah, I know, he called back. What payments are those, Mason? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Nothing you need to worry about, Ma, he said dismissively. I glanced over the documents he'd thrown. My heart sank seeing how much more they'd spent than I realized. Mason, could you contribute a bit to the household? Money is tight. 
I asked, my tone hopeful. Mason didn't even look up. Ah, sorry, slipped my mind. I'll get on it next time, he said offhandedly. Amber walked in, her face twisted in disdain. Honestly, this place is a nightmare. So old-fashioned and depressing. How did you ever live here, Nora? I bit back a retort and offered a thin smile. It's home, Amber. It has history. Well, history doesn't pay the bills now, does it? She snapped, rolling her eyes. She joined Mason, who was now scrolling through his phone. I sighed and returned to my papers. Something caught my eye, an unpaid bill that was unusually high. I made a mental note to investigate it further. I couldn't shake the feeling something was wrong. The next day curiosity got the best of me. I quietly checked Mason's office while they were out. I found unopened bills and receipts everywhere, and many were marked with overdue notices. My pulse quickened. This mess had to be cleaned up. But more urgently, I needed answers. Later that evening, I confronted Mason and Amber when they returned. Mason, we need to talk about these overdue bills, I said, holding up the pile of papers. His face hardened. Ma, stay out of my business. We're handling it. Handling it? This affects all of us, I retorted, my frustration bubbling over. Amber chimed in, her voice dripping with sarcasm. Maybe if you didn't spend on useless things, we wouldn't have a problem. Useless? Everything I buy is for the house, I said, feeling anger rise. Sure, keep telling yourself that, Amber said, tossing her hair back. I took a deep breath. Mason, something isn't adding up. I need to know what's going on, I said more calmly. Drop it, Ma, Mason said sternly. I said we'll take care of it. That night, I lay in bed wide awake. Their behavior, the financial discrepancies, it all felt wrong. I had to dig deeper. This had become more than just a family issue. It was a question of survival. Morning arrived, and as they left for their activities, I decided to visit Mason's workplace, a small tech startup. I needed to understand more. The office was a short drive away. When I walked in, Emily Harper, a young employee, greeted me. Hi, can I help you? She asked with a friendly smile. I'm Nora, Mason's mom. Just thought I'd drop by and say hi. Emily's smile faded slightly. Oh, Mason didn't mention you'd be coming. He's out right now. I see. How is he doing here, I asked, trying to sound casual. She hesitated. He's been having some trouble. Deadlines. Funds. He's under a lot of stress. I nodded, feeling a knot tighten in my stomach. Thank you, Emily. Leaving the office, one thing was clear. Mason and Amber were hiding something. I was determined to find out what, no matter the cost. Mason, the internet is down again, Amber yelled from the living room. Can't you fix it? There was a crash as Mason kicked a chair. I'll deal with it later, Amber. He snapped. He stormed past me, not bothering to even look in my direction. Mornings had become a battleground. Amber's tantrums and Mason's temper made my once peaceful home feel like a war zone. It was clear they were frustrated, but their anger seemed to land squarely on me. I couldn't keep dealing with the hostility without some sort of escape, so I found a job at a local art supply store. The manager, Mrs. Harper, welcomed me with open arms. It felt good to be doing something useful for myself. One afternoon, while sorting brushes and paints, Mrs. Sutherland Harper approached me. Nora, would you like to join our painting class this evening? I hesitated. I'm not sure if I'm any good. She smiled warmly. Everyone starts somewhere, plus, we could use an extra set of hands. That evening, I joined the class, and for the first time in a while, I felt genuinely at peace. I may not have been very skilled, but losing myself in the strokes of the brush was therapeutic. Returning home later than usual, I walked in to find Mason and Amber arguing, Just do something useful for once. Mason shouted, Useful? I'm doing everything while your mother is out playing with paints. Amber retorted. I'm back, I said softly, hoping to diffuse the tension. Amber glared at me. Perfect timing. We're out of groceries. Why don't you make yourself useful, Nora? I felt a wave of anger rise but held it back. I'll take care of it in the morning, I said calmly. Make sure you do, Amber muttered. The next day, I did the shopping, making sure to get exactly what they liked, to avoid more complaints. At the checkout, a canvas caught my eye. I decided to buy it, hoping to continue painting at home. When I got back, Amber was sprawled on the couch. About time, she said as I walked in with the bags. I ignored her, placing the groceries on the counter. Later, as I set up my canvas in the spare bedroom, Mason walked in. What is this? he demanded, looking at the canvas. It's for painting, I said, trying to stay composed. With what money, ma? Don't you get it? 
We're struggling to keep this place afloat, he yelled. I bought it with my own earnings from the store, I said firmly. Mason shook his head and walked out, mumbling something under his breath that I didn't catch. Over the next few weeks, painting became my refuge. My work at the store and the joy of painting helped balance the growing tension at home. One evening, Mrs. Harper approached me again. Nora, I've seen your paintings. They're quite good. Have you thought about selling them? she asked. I was stunned. I haven't. Do you really think they're worth selling? Yes, I do. We can start displaying them here at the store, she suggested. I nodded, feeling a spark of hope. Maybe this could be a way out of the bleakness at home. That night, as I served dinner, Amber sniped, Honestly, you're just a burden to everyone around, as an old woman who's of no use. I stopped, feeling the sting of her words, but I didn't respond. Instead, I went to my room, picked up my brush, and started painting. For every insult, I would channel it into my art. Soon, my paintings attracted attention. I made my first sale, then another. Each piece sold brought me a little more financial freedom and emotional strength. In secret, I started setting aside money, planning an escape if things worsened. Amber and Mason continued their rampage of entitlement. But now, I had something they couldn't touch. A sense of purpose and a path forward. And with every stroke of my brush, my resolve grew stronger. Selling one painting after another, I finally felt like I was contributing. But I kept my success a secret from Mason and Amber, knowing it would only cause more tension. The resentment in the house was growing thicker every day. One evening, while Amber was out, I found myself sitting with Mason over a rare shared meal. The silence was heavy, but I decided to break it. Mason, I've noticed financial discrepancies. Something doesn't add up, I said cautiously. Mason stiffened. I told you, I'm handling it. Stay out of it, ma. But it's affecting all of us. You're not contributing, and Amber seems more interested in spending than saving. I pushed my voice steady. He slammed his fork down. I said I'm handling it. I dropped the subject, knowing I wouldn't get anywhere with him tonight. Later, as I cleaned up, I overheard a phone conversation from Mason's office that made my blood go cold. I've transferred the funds. Just make sure the company doesn't catch on, Mason whispered urgently. Realizing the gravity of his words, I quietly moved away. I needed proof. Over the next week, I carefully recorded any conversations that hinted at their misdeeds, using my phone's recording feature. Amber was no better. She had brought home a stack of expensive clothing and jewelry. In a moment of carelessness, she'd left receipts lying around that showed she'd used funds from my account. I decided to confront her. Amber, these expenditures on my account are unacceptable. How could you? She looked at me with cold disdain. Oh, Nora, stop acting like it's a big deal. I'll pay it back. This is theft, Amber. I want the money back now, I insisted. She smirked. What are you going to do about it, old woman? My anger boiled over. This isn't over. Later that day, I took my recordings and receipts to a lawyer. The evidence was clear, and I was advised to start taking steps to secure my position. Secretly, I found a modest house to buy with the money I had saved from my paintings. It was small, but it was mine. The keys to the new house felt heavy in my pocket, a double-edged sword of freedom and fear. I still needed more proof to protect myself fully. That evening, Mason and Amber were out, and I seized the opportunity to dig deeper into Mason's office. Folders, emails, and files, everything pointed to him siphoning company funds. My chest tightened, realizing the depth of their betrayal. The next morning at breakfast, Amber looked over with a sneer. And what do you plan to do with your pathetic little paintings, Nora? Buy yourself a coffin. I shot back. I'm making enough to move out soon. You and Mason will have to fend for yourselves. Mason walked into the kitchen, hearing my last words. What's this about moving out? I've had enough. You've both been deceitful and abusive. I've found a new place. I said with a newfound firmness. Mason's face hardened. You think you're just going to leave us? We're your family. Family? You've done nothing but take advantage of me. I countered, my voice shaking but strong. Amber's laughter was cold. Good luck surviving on your own. You'll come crawling back. We'll see about that, I replied, holding her gaze. As days went by, I finalized my purchase, ensuring everything was in order to move quickly. But I wasn't just leaving. I was setting the stage to expose them. One evening, 
I gathered all the evidence, Amber's fraudulent activities and Mason's misappropriation of company funds. I waited until they were both home. Mason, Amber, we need to talk, I said tersely, holding up the folder of evidence. Amber rolled her eyes. Another one of your lectures? Mason's eyes narrowed. What is it now? I opened the folder and laid the documents on the table. This is proof that you've both been stealing and cheating. Their faces drained of color. Tomorrow I'm showing these to the authorities. My new house is ready, and you're not coming with me, I declared, my voice steady and strong. Their protests and threats echoed as I walked away, but I felt a weight lifted from my shoulders. This was just the beginning of my fight for justice, and I was ready. I spent the next few days preparing for the move, making sure everything was in place at the new house. I didn't tell Mason and Amber anything more about my plans keeping my intentions under wraps. One morning, I packed the last of my belongings and left a note behind. It simply read, Goodbye and good luck. I felt a mixture of relief and nervousness as I closed the door behind me. This was it. My new beginning. Arriving at my new house, I took a deep breath. It was smaller and simpler than my old home, but it felt like a sanctuary. I set up my art supplies in a corner of the living room, ready to dive into my painting again. A few hours later, there was a frantic knock at the door. I opened it to find Mason and Amber standing there, faces flushed with anger and panic. You can't just leave. We need you. Mason shouted, his voice breaking. This house is mine, and mine alone. I declared with a firmness that brooked no argument. Amber pushed past Mason, her eyes wild. What are we supposed to do now? You can't abandon us, she spat. I haven't abandoned you. I replied calmly, you abandoned your responsibilities and proved you couldn't be trusted. Mason stepped forward, trying a different approach. Please, Ma, let's just talk this through. We can work something out. No, Mason. I'm done talking. I found out about the company funds you've been misappropriating, I said, watching his face pale. He started to bluster. You don't understand. It's not what it looks like. I understand perfectly, I interrupted. And, Amber, you've been draining my accounts for your own luxuries. Amber scoffed, crossing her arms. You really think you can survive without us? I stepped back, resolving to make my final stand. I am surviving without you. You underestimated me. And now you're going to face the consequences. With that, I shut the door on their stunned faces, locking it behind me. I heard them shout and pound on the door. But I ignored them. This was my new chapter, and they were no longer a part of it. The next day, I contacted the authorities and provided all the evidence I had gathered. It wasn't just about my money, it was about justice and finally standing up for myself. Mason and Amber showed up at my door once more, this time pleading and promising to change. Please, Ma, we're sorry. Just give us another chance, Mason begged. Amber nodded, tears streaming down her face. We need you. We can't do this without you. I shook my head, feeling a strange sense of calm. It's too late. You've already shown me who you are and I deserve better. They left, defeated and broken. As they walked away, I felt a wave of emotions, relief, sadness, but more than anything, empowerment. In the weeks that followed, I focused on settling into my new life. My art continued to flourish, bringing in enough to comfortably support myself. Each day I felt stronger and more independent. Mason and Amber's betrayals were reported to the authorities, and they faced the consequences of their actions. It wasn't an easy battle, but it was one I was determined to see through. One evening, as I painted in the quiet of my new home, I thought about the journey that had brought me here. I had turned pain into purpose, anger into action, and for the first time in a long time, I felt a profound sense of peace. A knock on the door startled me out of my peaceful morning routine. I opened it to see Mason, looking more haggard than ever. He wasted no time pushing his way inside, eyes wild with desperation. "'What do you want, Mason?' I asked, keeping my voice steady. "'We need to talk, Ma. You can't keep doing this to us,' he pleaded, his tone urgent. Amber hovered near the door, her face etched with worry and anger. She stomped into the room, snapping, "'You think you can ruin our lives and just walk away?' I walked to the kitchen counter, putting some distance between us. "'You ruined your own lives with your choices.' I'm done suffering for them. Mason's composure cracked. This is all a misunderstanding. We're not the villains here. I couldn't help but laugh bitterly. Not the villains? 
You stole from me and your company, lied and manipulated. How are you the victim? Amber's face twisted horrifically. We took what we deserved. You owe us. I owe you. Look around, Amber. I worked hard for this house, my peace. You belittled and exploited me. I owe you nothing. Mason stepped closer, trying another tactic. Please, Ma, we can fix this. Just drop the charges and we'll pay you back. Drop the charges? This is bigger than repaying me. It's about accountability. You think you can swindle your way out of everything? I said, shaking my head. Amber's rage boiled over. You miserable, ungrateful hag. We did everything for you, and this is how you repay us? Everything for me? I shot back. You mean everything to benefit yourselves. I've seen your true colors. Now it's time for you to face the consequences. Mason collapsed onto the couch, holding his head in his hands. Please, Ma, don't do this. We need help. We can't make it without you. And I needed respect, dignity, and honesty. But you didn't think of that, did you? I sighed, feeling the weight of the years of manipulation lift. At that moment, the doorbell rang again. I opened it to find two police officers standing there. Are you Nora Collins? One of them asked. Yes, I am, I replied, stepping aside to let them in. Amber's eyes widened in horror. No, this can't be happening. You can't let them take us. The officers stepped forward, addressing Mason and Amber. Mason Collins, Amber Davis, you are under arrest for fraud and embezzlement. Mason's face turned a ghostly white. Ma, do something. Talk to them, he begged as he was handcuffed. Amber screamed, thrashing as they restrained her. You can't do this. We're family. I watched silently as the officers led them away, their protests echoing down the hallway. It was a heartbreaking sight, yet I felt a sense of justice being served. Once they were gone, the quiet of the house felt deafening. I walked back to my easel, picking up a brush with trembling hands. Dipping it into the paint, I tried to steady myself through the familiar motion. As I worked, I reflected on the confrontation. This wasn't about revenge anymore. It was about reclaiming my life and ensuring that Mason and Amber faced the consequences of their actions. Mrs. Harper had been a wonderful support through all this, offering advice and encouragement as I balanced my work at the store and the challenges at home. When I next saw her, I shared what had happened. Nora, you did the right thing. Sometimes the hardest choices lead to the most important changes, she said kindly. I nodded. I hope so. For now, I just want to move forward. And so I did. Each day became a step toward healing, creating new routines in my quiet, comforting home. Though the scars remained, I knew I had emerged stronger and more self-assured than I ever thought possible. The reality of Mason and Amber's arrest didn't truly sink in until I visited the police station to finalize my statement. As I walked through the cold, sterile corridors, I felt a mixture of apprehension and resolve. This was it, the point of no return. An officer led me to an interview room. Miss Collins, we'll need you to recount everything again for the record, he said, his tone professional yet compassionate. I took a deep breath and began, detailing the lies, the theft, the manipulations. For the first time, I laid everything bare without fear. My voice remained steady as I recounted each betrayal, each moment of pain, knowing this was a necessary step for justice. When I finished, the officer nodded. Thank you, Miss Collins. Your courage in coming forward is commendable. As I stepped out of the station, I noticed a familiar face in the waiting area. It was Emily Harper, Mrs. Harper's daughter. She stood up and approached me. Nora, I heard what happened. I'm so sorry you had to go through all this, she said softly. Thank you, Emily. It's been tough, but it needed to be done, I replied. Mom wanted me to check in on you. She's been worried, Emily added. Tell her I appreciate it, and I'll drop by the store soon. I said, grateful for the support. That evening, I allowed myself a moment of reflection. The house was quiet, almost peaceful. I picked up my phone and called Mrs. Harper. Nora, how are you holding up? Her warm voice asked. I'm okay, Mrs. Harper. Mason and Amber are facing their consequences. I said, feeling a strange mix of relief and sadness. You did the right thing. You deserve peace, Nora, she reassured me. Thank you, I whispered, grateful for her kindness. The next few days were filled with legal proceedings and meetings with lawyers. I attended court sessions, where Mason and Amber's crimes were laid bare for all to see. They tried to plead for leniency, but the evidence was overwhelming. After one particularly grueling session, Mason approached me in the hallway. His eyes were red, and he looked defeated. 
Ma, please. Can't you help us? We were wrong, but we don't deserve this, he begged. I met his gaze feeling a pang of sorrow, but knowing I had to stand firm. Mason, you made your choices. Now you have to face the consequences. There's nothing more I can do. Amber stood behind him, her defiance crumbling into desperation. Nora, please, we're family. Family doesn't do what you did. I can't help you anymore, I said quietly. As they were led away, I felt a sense of closure. This chapter of my life was ending, but it was paving the way for a new beginning. Returning home, I focused on my art. Each brushstroke was a step toward healing, each painting a testament to my resilience. The small gallery I'd created in my living room began to grow, each piece reflecting the journey I had undertaken. One afternoon, Mrs. Harper visited. She walked through my makeshift gallery, admiring the paintings. These are beautiful, Nora. You've come such a long way, she said, her eyes filled with admiration. Thank you. It's been a lifeline, I replied, feeling a swell of pride. We sat down with cups of tea, the conversation turning to the future. What's next for you, Nora? Mrs. Harper asked. I think I'll keep painting, maybe even start displaying them more widely. And I want to focus on finding peace, I said, feeling hopeful. You have a gift, Nora. Share it with the world. And remember, you're stronger than you think, she said, giving my hand a reassuring squeeze. As she left, I looked around my home, filled with the artwork that had become a symbol of my journey. The past was behind me, and I was ready for whatever the future held. I had faced the darkness. And now, it was time to embrace the light. Life had a new rhythm, a steadier one. The court proceedings were behind me, and both Mason and Amber were serving their sentences. There was a strange peace in the aftermath, a calm I hadn't felt in years. My little house had become my sanctuary. I spent my days painting and working part-time at the art supply store. Mrs. Harper continued to be a wonderful support, often stopping by to check on me and discuss new art supplies or techniques. One late afternoon, as I was adding the finishing touches to a vibrant landscape, the doorbell rang. I opened it to find Emily Harper holding a beautifully wrapped gift. Hi, Nora. Mom and I wanted to give you this, she said, handing me the parcel. What's this? I asked, curious. Just open it, Emily urged, smiling warmly. I untied the ribbon and lifted the lid to reveal an exquisite set of oil paints and brushes. Tears welled up in my eyes. Thank you, Emily. Please tell your mom I'm so grateful. Will do. We're both so proud of how far you've come, she said, giving me a hug before leaving. As I set up the new paints, my phone rang. It was a number I didn't recognize. Answering, I heard a familiar voice. Nora, it's Jane from the gallery downtown. Jane Taylor ran one of the local galleries and had expressed interest in my art before. Hi, Jane. What can I do for you? I've been following your work, and I'd love to feature your paintings in an upcoming exhibit. What do you think? She asked, excitement clear in her voice. I, I'd be honored, I stammered, overwhelmed by the offer. Great. We'll finalize details soon. Prepare to showcase your talent, Nora, she said before ending the call. Hanging up, a grin spread across my face. It felt like a new chapter was opening, one where my art would finally receive the recognition it deserved. A week later, I stood in the center of the gallery, surrounded by my paintings. Jane had done a fantastic job arranging the exhibit, giving each piece the space it needed to shine. Mrs. Harper and Emily arrived early to support me. Nora, these are amazing! Mrs. Harper exclaimed, looking around with admiration. Thanks to your encouragement, I replied, feeling a swell of gratitude. Throughout the evening, people approached me, praising my work and asking about my journey. It was a surreal experience, sharing the story of how painting had become my refuge and my strength. As the night drew to a close, I found myself alone with Jane. Your work resonates with so many people, Nora. You have a real gift she said, sincerity in her eyes. Thank you, Jane. It means the world to me, I replied, feeling a sense of accomplishment. Returning home, my heart felt light. The once heavy burden of my past had lifted, replaced by hope and new possibilities. The future seemed bright, promising new opportunities and continued growth. In the following weeks, my paintings gained popularity. I received commissions and invitations to display my work in other galleries, each new project was a step toward solidifying my identity as an artist. One sunny afternoon, while relaxing in my garden, Mrs. Harper visited with exciting news. Nora, 
the local art school wants you to teach a class. Interested? Teaching? I've never considered that, I replied, intrigued. They think you'd be perfect. Sharing your techniques and experiences could inspire others, Mrs. Harper encouraged. The idea planted a seed of excitement. All right, I'll give it a try. It sounds like a wonderful opportunity. As the days turned into weeks and months, my new life flourished. I balanced painting, teaching, and enjoying quiet moments in my garden. The scars of the past were still there, but they no longer defined me. They were part of my journey, a testament to my resilience. One evening, as the sun set, I reflected on everything I'd endured and accomplished. I felt gratitude for the strength I'd found and the new path I was forging. Life was a canvas, and I was painting it with vibrant, resilient strokes, each one a testament to my journey, my survival, and my new beginnings.